Thanks for joining. Uh, this, this is a very special stream. Today's talk is about linear type and runtime performance. This is the topic of my thesis, my master thesis here at St. Andrews. I was invited to give this talk at the University of Glasgow today, but given the circumstances, uh, the talk was canceled, rightfully which gave us the really unique opportunity to move everything online, which is great because it makes everything a lot more accessible. However, the online format is a lot less understood than the in-person format. So this is uh, also a uh, kind of experiment. So I encourage you, since we can't have raise of hands here, I encourage you to join the voice chat that is linked into um, the Twitch chat. I'm gonna link it again, copy and paste. And I will hang out there after the talk. We can discuss, we can um, discuss more questions, uh, more plans. Uh, we can probably do that sometimes else. I'm also very grateful for the University of Glasgow to invite me for this talk. Uh, just a bit about PLUG. Uh, PLUG is for Programming Languages at University of Glasgow. It's a series of seminars that they gave throughout the, the semester about programming languages. And they thought that uh, I would be a good addition to their seminars. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so I prepared a small, you know, a small talk that explains what I've been working on. What is the subject of this thesis? Why we're doing this? and uh, what are things that uh, you can do today to keep advantage, uh, take advantage of it and use it. So my thesis comes from a problem. The problem is writing programs is difficult, but not only it's difficult, it's difficult in very different ways. One of the ways it's difficult is um, performance. So you can write a program, it can have bugs, it can have problems, it can be slow, and how to not make it slow is a very important um, question. A lot of programming languages allow you to make programs fast, but a lot of other programming languages don't allow you to write precise performance guarantees about um, the instructions. So what are typical programming languages and like what are the difference between those languages? Something we're going to explore very quickly. So if I, if I mention performance, what are the languages that come up? So those are examples of programming languages that you might think of when you think of performance. Those uh, languages run programs that go fast and languages that are efficient and more specifically, um, and oh, sorry, and more in general, those programming languages uh, don't really have anything necessarily in common. So C and C++ are very similar to each other. They both have um, manual memory management. Uh, one of them is object-oriented. The other one is uh, very close to you know, computer instructions. Rust and Swift are newer programming languages, but they're also targeted to performance. Um, and in this case, performance is is the word they use for to describe performance is systems programming engineering. So those are programming languages with which you can write entire programming, uh, entire operating systems or firmware or low level software. Now, what is the opposite of uh, fast? What is the opposite of performant uh, programs or performant programming languages? And that would be uh, languages that are slow or, or thought about uh, as being slow. And here I picked three examples of programming languages that I think of when I th when I think, oh, it's a programming language that does not really allow you to go as fast as you want. So here we have Python and JavaScript, and I've put Scala as well. And uh, again, like in general, those programming languages are very different. Uh, those two are interpreted, and this one is compiled. So you might think, if you look at the previous list here, oh, all those programming languages are compiled. They must be fast, so compiling must make it fast. However, Scala is compiled and is not particularly fast. There even is um, a specific effort to make Scala fast called Scala-native, 
which goal is to compile Scala down to um, machine instructions to make it really fast instead of JVM. So what it is that makes Python slow and JavaScript slow and Scala slow, and what is it that makes uh, C and Rust and Swift really fast? And I would argue the main difference between those and those is memory management. So those languages allow you to manage memory very, very um, carefully, very fine-grained. And this comes at different costs. So C and C++, you can manage memory at the cost of safety. Rust, you can manage memory-ish uh, at the cost of complexity while writing the program. You are limited in what kind of programs you can write in Rust because of its memory model. And Swift tries to get closer to normal programming languages, but you still have memory management issues with things like reference cycles in which you have to uh, define manually, oh, this pointer is called weak, which means it will not count as a reference, which will help the garbage collector. Um, and those programming languages are slow for different reasons. So those are interpreted, and interpretation does not allow you to have a lot of room for optimizations. Scala is slow because it uses a lot of immutability, and immutability, especially in the context of the JVM, which is the runtime of Scala, is uh, problematic because you will create a lot of intermediate data structures, and those data structures will have to be collected and reclaimed, and all this process of creating and reclaiming memory is slow, which makes then the language slow. So what about functional programming languages? The reason we study functional programming languages is nothing to do with how fast or how slow they are, and it's more to do with how nice it is to work with them when you consider their properties. So um, here I've, I've put up a list of different functional programming languages that I'm familiar with, and I've ordered them from how close they are to a programming language to how close they are to a theorem prover. And so at the beginning, we have Scala and Haskell, and at the end, we have Agda and Koch. And so how is Scala and Haskell, like in terms of performance? I would say their, their, their performance is ish. Uh, Scala is slow-ish, Haskell is fast-ish, um, by which I mean, in my experience, in my personal experience of writing large-scale programs, Scala tends to be slower quickie, quickly, whereas Haskell tends to be, by default, very fast, but then um, once you get into higher complexity programs, breaks down very, very easily. Idris is just slow in general, um, and one of the reasons why it's slow is that Idris, unlike others, has very complex feature, has a very complex type system, has dependent types. And those depend dependent types can leak into the runtime and make it very slow. And the last two are a joke because who, who like even though people run Agda programs and people run Koch programs, it's very unlikely that you will use either of those two to actually write large scale um, commercial programs like web servers, video games, services, firmware, etc. So in those cases, when you're close to be a theorem prover, the question of are you performant becomes irrelevant because what matters for a theorem prover is not how fast you are, but merely how correct you are. Correctness trumps everything. So with that, with that said, um, the hypothesis that my, um, my thesis is based on is memory management is the next step to make Idris fast. So I've, uh, to, to go to, to find a, a vector of, of study for this, I've written a program in C and in different languages. And I'm going to show you how memory management works here. So we have the first line, which allocates uh, a space of memory of 32 characters and we fill the beginning of it by with this string. Then we find the middle, and then at the middle we add the pipe symbol. 
and the rest of the program is shifting the rest of the memory space uh, for each character and then returning the changed line. And as you can imagine, this will take the first four characters and then add a pipe in the middle and then have the four remaining characters. I wrote the same program in Swift, which is also a fast programming language. And you have the same kind of structure, except I've put everything in a function. You have here an allocation of a new string. Here you have a function that modifies the string and at the end you use it. And the function that does the modification does something very special. It mutates the string, right? It never allocates anything. It just takes the string that is given and does the, and use this method called insert and insert will mutate the string, will change the string without creating new copies. And you can see that it does that because of the ampersand symbol here and the in out keyword here. This means take the value, take the value um, as an argument and don't make a copy of it. And this means give the value, but don't, um, don't copy the value when you give it. And, and this is now can be used in insert so that when you're given the value, you actually modify the pointer to it. You don't modify, you don't create copies of it that are, that are different. And so the most complex part of this program is actually computing this middle index because Swift strings are Unicode strings. And as we all know, Unicode strings are very hard. So this, um, this just computes the middle index inside a Unicode string. So the structure of both those programs is very similar. At first we allocate, then we find the middle, then we mutate, and then we return. Here's the same thing. We allocate, we mutate, and we return. Can we do the same thing in Idris? What would it look like in Idris? And again, Idris is, wait, I'm picking Idris because that's the language I'm working on. Um, here we allocate a string. It's the same string. We find the middle. We split the string in two halves. The first half where we take uh, the first half and then the, the, the remaining, remaining where we drop the first half. And then we do our operation where we concatenate everything by adding the pipe in the middle and sandwiching it with the two halves. The problem with this is um, every one of those lines makes a new copy. So take makes a new copy with left, right makes a new copy with uh, the right part of the string, and the return makes a third copy of left, pipe, right. The question becomes, can we do better? Can we avoid all those copies so that we get closer to the, the memory, uh, the memory performance that we had in C and in Swift? And I would argue that we can by using linear types. Now, linear types are not uh, very common. They're actually uh, not mainstream at all. One of the reasons for them for that is that it's not very well understood. Linear types come from oh, come from linear logic. Linear logic is um, is an area of logic that has been developed in the end, end of the eighties by Girard, and I'm just surprised that oh there we are right here. Linear logic is an area of logic that had been developed by Girard. And here you have the rules, but the rules themselves don't really matter. Uh, what's special about linear logic is this end part here, which says uh, you have two sides, um, you have two, two versions of the world. You have a version that is linear and a version that is normal. And what linear means in linear logic is that if you are given something, you have to use this property exactly once. If it's not linear, you can do whatever you want with it. But if it's linear, you have to use it exactly once. So if you have a deduction and you are given an assumption and the assumption is linear, then you have to use the assumption in your deduction exactly once. 
So in Idris, the way this translates is uh, if you write this function traditionally, duplicate takes an argument and returns a pair and just repeats the same value twice. So if we take a value v of type a, we just return v and v, and this duplicates the value in a pair. Now if we do the same thing with a linear annotation, which is represented by the one here, that says, uh, I am given a, but a is linear, which means a can, can be used and has to be used exactly once. And you write the same function and try to compile, you get a type error. And the error is, there are two uses of the linear name v. So this is illegal because we've used v twice when we said it can only be used once. Similarly, if you write the function ignore, which takes anything and returns the unit, which is just which returns just a value, um, traditionally this works, this works fine. But if we say that a is linear, that means we have to use a exactly once. And v, which is the value of type a, is not used here. Since it's not used, the compiler will catch this problem and will say there are zero uses of linear variable v. So um, just from reading this, we can ask ourselves, is this, is this enough? Is this actually useful for memory management? Can we do anything? And you have to realize uh, we, have, we can make up a rule out of this. We don't know. But if we make up something, uh, here's the idea. If we know that we use something only once and we don't share it, we can just mutate the variable. So if I, if I take the keywords, if we know something that is used only once and never again anywhere else, we can just mutate the thing instead of making copies. Because remember, the problem of Idris was that it would make copies. And those copies are inefficient. So if we take again our example, um, and we add a linearity annotation that says string is used exactly once, immediately we run into a problem. Because here, though we have said string is linear, string has been used three times once to compute the midpoint of the string, once to compute the first half of the string, and once to compute the later half of the string. So the first solution for this is to do something called borrowing. So if we allow functions to borrow value from the context, or from the argument, maybe we can say, well, I can lend you this value as long as you promise that you will just look at it and not do anything with it. So we can change our syntax and we can add those ampersand here and we can say, well, string is linear, but we can use it multiple times because we're not actually using it. We're just giving it temporarily to someone because they just need to look at it, but they don't, they can't change it. Um, and then you can just lend it to multiple things, and then this function will be fine. Now, um, the problem with that is uh, we have multiple, we're not sure if uh, it actually works for two reasons. The first one is there is no rule in linear logic that tells us what borrowing means. Uh, we would have to make up a rule. And the second one is whatever rule we make up uh, has to be consistent with the fact that we use string exactly once. And here, uh, we can imagine that length does not consume the string, right? Length only looks at the string as, uh, at the length of the string as metadata. It does not actually need to consume the string. But take and drop, you, make, you can make the argument that they actually consume the string. Um, and then we still have the problem that if we borrow three times, does that mean that we use it once? 
can we can we just lend it to the first take and give it to write? Those rules are uh, unclear. We don't know that and hasn't been implemented. But this is something we could do and we could try. So here's another option. The other option is make everything linear. But if we make everything linear, um, the goal is to fix those three here uh, versions of the string that we're using. Because so we're using the string once here, second time here, and third time here. Can we can we avoid using it three times and rewrite our program such that everything is linear? And so for this, we're going to use special functions. I'm going to call it length prime and split. And length prime will, given a linear list, return um, the length and a new list. And so when you take, when you have a function that has a linear argument, it means two things. It means either you inspect it, so you pattern match on it, or it means that you use it uh, on the return side of the function. Is it like you, you, you give it to a function or you give it as return type or you give it as an argument, but you do something on the right hand side. Here we're deciding to pattern match on it. So here's how we use it. And in the case where the list is empty, well, the size of the list is zero and the new list is the empty list. In the case the list is not empty, we look at the length of the rest of the list and we add one to the length of the rest of the list and we add the element we just saw to the rest of the list. Now this does not actually fix our memory management program, that problem, because here we are taking lists and we're creating a new list. Um, and that's no good, right? The goal is to avoid making copies. So if we go through this solution, we would have to have a lot of magic to make this list and this list the same without creating new uh, copies. Now, if you look at split, um, I haven't implemented split because again, we're going to need a lot of magic to make this work. So split would take nats, which is a length at which you will split. Then it takes a string and returns uh, the two substrings after you split in the middle. Uh, but again, this will require a lot of magic. And then we can rewrite our main function using those linear versions of everything we've seen before. Now, if we take a closer look here, so this is our new main using our new function. You see using length here and splits here. If we look more carefully, string here is used exactly once because it's, it's um, declared here and used here. Then uh, L and string prime are used exactly once here. And remember, L is the length of the string. And string prime is the same as the string, except it has a new linear count. Since this one has been consumed, we can't use it anymore. But we can use this refreshed version called string prime, and we can use it here. And now left and right are used here and here. So since we know that all of those things have been used exactly once and we don't share them anywhere, like they don't appear outside of this context, we could just take this space of memory and take this space of memory, say they are the same, and take those two spaces of memory and say they are the same, and take those operations say, well, those operations usually should create a new string, but since we know we're not going to share anything and they're already been used, we can just mutate the thing and add the thing in the middle. Now, is this, does this actually work? And again, I don't know, but that's what I'm working on. Uh, and that's uh, very close to what I'm working on. So what I'm working on precisely is in this case, it should work because we are accessing the raw constructor. And when you're accessing, like when you're constructing the value and then changing it, you know that this is um, this is the only way you could get it. If, if the value would come from somewhere else, 
it could have been shared before. And if it could have been shared before, then you can't assume that it that's not shared. Like you always have to assume that it's already being used somewhere and then you have to make a copy. But since the constructor is in scope, you know that you don't share it and therefore you can mutate the thing. So we don't know, and I'm working on this and I'm very close to getting something done soon. Um, and hopefully this will be the, the bulk of my thesis um, this year. Now there's a third option uh, and that's what Granule is doing, but Granule is not looking at performance. Granule is looking at how do we mix uh, theoretically different kinds of um, modalities. And those are like linear types, but uh, they have more utility. So the way it looks like, the, the way it works is we have our program here. But the problem with this program is that we have had to rewrite it in such a way that is not natural to our initial intuition. Our initial intuition was find the middle, split, well, find the middle and mutate the thing. And all this mutation, all this split is uh, now uh, hidden by this different interface, right? We have to make, uh, you have to make a new identifier for your string, even though it's the same. And then you have to have a magic function. We don't know what the magic function does. We can't even implement it. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just take all program and magically add some, some information to make it more efficient. And here's what I propose. Here's a proposal is uh, instead of making it linear, um, you make it graded. And that means that only you can give one as a value, say it's being used exactly once. But you can say this one is used exactly three times, right? See this one here? We say str is used three times and it appears three times here. Same thing with half. We create half and we say half is used exactly two times and here they are. And now left and right. Left and right is used exactly once, once here and once here for right. And so uh, from this question, um, so now the question again becomes, does, does this actually work, right? And we still don't know, but uh, there is a good reason to believe it would work because our rule of if it's used exactly once or if it's used, if it's entirely consumed rather, if it's entirely consumed and we don't share it, then we can just mutate the thing. So here's the example, str here, is used uh, three times. So if you look at the next line, you see that str here is used once, so we can still use it twice. Then you keep going, str is used again, so we decrease this count and it can still be used once. And here we finished using string and we consumed it entirely. Since we consumed it entirely, we can free the memory, but you don't have to free it immediately. Since we know, because of this relationship, that the result of the string is used for the return type, you can just keep the memory where it is, use, use those values as pointers to the memory that is already there, do not release it, and then do the mutation here. Now the problem is, uh, this is very tricky because we changed the rule from linear to entirely con consumed. Uh, but it should, in theory, like um, just thinking about it, there is nothing preventing us from doing this. And now there is something else. The last thing I want to mention is um, this number here counts the number of uses of string. And here you can see that it decreases by one, then decreases by one, then decreases by one, and then we know it can free. This is extremely close to how a reference counter uh, runtime works. So in reference counting, you are given variables and you have a counter attached to each variable. And the counter tells you how many, how many bits of codes are looking at this one variable. And if there is nothing looking at it, it means it's, it's 
can, can be free, right? Because no part of the code is using it, and since nobody's using it, it probably means it's useless now. And if you can hook up a reference counting runtime to this behavior, you can generalize the idea that if something has been entirely consumed, then instead of freeing it, you can simply reuse its memory space. And so not only that would um, make this case uh, usable, it would generalize the concept of entirely consumed. Because my thesis focuses right now on cases where the constructor, the value is constructed in scope. So it hasn't been shared before. So it can't be shared. It could be shared later, but if it's consumed right now, then it can't be shared. With the reference counting runtime, what you can do is you can assume that a variable has already been shared before, come to you, you go through its usages, and then automatically you can decide what's the reference count. Is it higher than one or is it zero? And if it's zero, we, uh, is, is the value in memory being used uh, again, like as a mutation? Are we making a copy of something inside the memory? If we are, don't make the copy. Don't make the copy and just reuse the space in memory. And so the reference counting runtime would actually generalize uh, my approach of looking at constructors in scope, seeing if they're linear and seeing if they're, they're uh, used. This is future work. So my thesis focuses on constructors in scope. Uh, future work, hopefully for PhD, would be generalize this approach to a reference count in runtime such that you can reuse all variables that are about to be freed um, by simply reusing the memory. And talking about future work, there is uh, an in infinite amount of work to do here. So linear types are not very well understood, not very, not used very often, um, which is unfortunate because they seem to have a lot of potential, especially to make functional programs faster and to make programs also easier to use or easier to understand or easier to read or easier to document because they give you more information about how the program actually behaves. So here are a couple of things that I um, mentioned that I think are worthy of your attention in the future. Uh, so multiple simmerings is what Granule is looking at, is having multiple uh, ways of counting the resources that are available. So the resources we're talking about here is uh, how many times they can use variable. But you can have all sorts of other kind of resources. For example, um, uh, is this socket open or closed? Or is this variable, uh, is, is this user logged in or logged out? Um, or is this value private or public? Uh, those things can also be in theory, combined together. So you could have multiple ways of tracking resources. Uh, here we have graded times with uh, 0, 1, and 3, uh, uh, 1, 2, and 3. But uh, you could mix graded types and linear types. In theory, there is nothing preventing you from doing that. We, we could do that. And Granule is looking at this. And it would be nice if we could look at this also through the lens, lens of um, performance. Uh, this is where this one comes up, QTT and Comonads. I just call it Comonads for the general graded modal types, which I would summarize as um, this is about compilers that are able to look at the context of every instruction that you're writing. So if you're writing a fun an instruction, not only the compiler will check its type and will generate machine code, but it will also be able to tell Oh, is this instruction special given the context? Can we access the context to either make it redundant or make it faster or give it more information to later functions? And QTT is the theory behind Idris 2. Idris 2 is not actually linear. Um, Idris 2 uses, uh, this is for, oh my God, I forgot, quanti quantitative type theory. So it's quantified. So values have a, a, a quantity. Uh, the quantity we're using is 0, 1, I can write this, 0, 1, or unrestricted. 
Um, but this is very, uh, this is very, like this is very restrictive. And also, uh, we're not actually using any of this for proofs, which is what I've written here. So for example, once, when, once you add linearity annotation to some functions, they become impossible to write. Functions, for example, um, like this function, zero a, a, this means a is used zero times and we return a. But since we have no information about a, uh, this type is actually uninhabited. Can we, can we prove that this type is uninhabited? Can we write proofs about things that are inhabited sometimes, but not when the linearity uh, value changes? This is also an area of research uh, that is unexplored. Now, user-defined resources is the thing I mentioned with granules. So uh, not only you could have multiple semi-rings, multiple type kind of resources, you could also tell the user, well, please tell me, give me uh, a type of resource that you want me to track, and the compiler then will keep track of it. Uh, and we'll have to follow some, some specific uh, definitions, like has to be a semi-ring, has to have an order, etc. Now, this is also something I want to explore next year. Exponentials as malloc. So exponentials is the last rule we saw in the linear logic uh, rules, where you can say QTT uh, has, has exponentials where you can say, I have a pair of two things. The first thing is the amount of resources available, and the second thing is the thing itself. And so what you can say is, for example, you could rewrite uh, duplicate by saying, duplicate has the type where it takes a value and it takes a resource to duplicate this value, and then returns the pair, which duplicates the value, which is a very, like, it's a very convoluted way to say, um, prepare to allocate some memory, create something now. And the special thing about QTT is that you have to give it a specific quantity. So you give it the quantity and then you, you create the thing and then you have multiple copies of it. And this could also probably make programming easier because now you only have a way to eliminate uh, or reuse memory, you also have a very, very explicit way to allocate memory. And the last thing is uh, intervals in a fine type is something I was playing with recently, is since you can just replace uh, 0, 1, and omega with anything else, can you replace 0, 1, and omega by intervals? And intervals give you a fine types. So if you have an interval 0, 1, and here you have a function that takes um, takes an argument zero or one time, it becomes affine. That's what affine means. Affine means you're not sure of the linearity, but it's like it's bounded between those two values. Um, and you could have things, uh, arbitrary things, like it's being used between three and five times. And there is a case where it's used three times, a case where it's used four times, and there is no case where it's used five times, but that should work. So those are all areas of research that uh, we should look into, I'm going to look into. Uh, they are all very interesting. They all have a very useful outcomes, both in the short term and long term. And I hope that programming languages will be able to learn from that and get more, both more efficient and easier to write as a result. So thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you found this useful. I hope you will uh, join me in this adventure of working with linear types, working with Idris, and adopting Idris as an efficient programming language, not just as a research tool. Um, before I go, uh, here are the contacts where you can find me. So this is my Twitter account. There's an underscore here that doesn't show. This is the Twitch channel that I'm streaming this on where you can join me every week where I'm streaming. Probably won't be streaming this week or if you're like a couple days because uh, internet at home is really bad and I'll be at home. And this is the university uh, email where you can join me if you, if you need to, if you want to talk, if you want to share ideas about linearity, if you want prototypes or if you want to organize another talk like this. And uh, special thanks to Plug, which invited me but couldn't make it. Uh, here is the um, website for plug and here's the 
uh, URL for uh, the university. I will put those in the description below. And um, now I will hop into the chat and answer questions. Or if you have questions, uh, pop them in the chat. All right, thank you.